I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to our Natural Area Management Services webinar, part seven. We have rounded the clubhouse turn. We are into the final stretch of the webinar series in Vegetation Management Week. The webinar series is a production of the Woods in Your Backyard Partnership, a cooperative effort of the University of Maryland Extension, Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, Virginia Cooperative Extension, Penn State Extension, and the Virginia Department of Forestry. Funding for this webinar was made possible in part by a grant from the, from the Harry R. Hughes Center for Agroecology at the University of Maryland. We've covered quite a bit of ground in the three weeks previous. We're now dealing with Vegetation Management Week, and we'll be wrapping up on Thursday night with non-herbicide control and efficacy on competing vegetation. But tonight we're talking about using forest herbicides to control competing and invasive vegetation. Tonight's session will provide detailed information on proper equipment and PPE necessary to make woodland herbicide applications. This will include how to select the proper herbicide and application technique, including hack and squirt, stump treatment, foliar, and basal bark. We'll also touch on calibrating backpack sprayers for woodland applications and herbicide applications for controlling various invasive and competing plants will be covered in detail. I'm Andrew Kling. I've been with you throughout the series. Uh, you don't see Agnes's picture there tonight because she can't be with us. Uh, we're going to go through all of this because we've been through all the housekeeping. Uh, just want to remind you to make sure that uh, you look for the link in our email when the webinar recording is available. And remember to look for the email for acquiring continuing education credits for joining us live. And everyone's been great about figuring out where to put their questions and their comments, questions in the Q&A and comments in the chat. So I don't need to uh, repeat all of this, but I do wanna make sure you remember, and we've been saying this throughout the series, but we are now in the last week of the webinar series, we'll be sending out an evaluation for the entire series within a week of the final session and the final session being Thursday. So it'll be coming to your inbox fairly soon. And please, give us your honest feedback. Tell us what worked, tell us what you didn't like, where we can improve, and um, tell us, you know, your, your any general comments you have. Uh, if there's something you'd like to see us cover in another series, let us know, because that is really what helps us figure out what we do next, what people out there really want to hear. So that's uh, very important feedback we need to get from you folks. Now, tonight's speakers are both from Penn State, Dave Jackson and Art Gover. Let me tell you a little bit about each of them. Dave is employed by Penn State Extension as a regional forest resources educator in central Pennsylvania. He's been with Penn State in his current position since January 2002. He has a Bachelor of Science degree from the College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse, New York, and completed a Master's of Forest Resources at the Penn State University. Before coming to Penn State, Dave worked in various positions with the US Forest Service, forest industry, state forestry, and private forestry consulting. Now, Art is an extension specialist with the Wildland Weed Management Program in the Department of Plant Science at Penn State. He's worked at Penn State since 1985, engaging in vegetation management in settings ranging from agronomic crops, roadside and utility corridors, turf and ornamentals, and his current emphasis of vegetation management in habitat and forest settings. His primary duties are to assist land managers in developing and implementing habitat management plans at system-wide and park levels, to provide operational and classroom training for staff and volunteers, to conduct field research to refine current practice, to provide support for field staff on an ongoing basis, and to curate the wildland weed management website at Penn State. Areas of interest include habitat management, riparian buffer management, suppression of problem species, prioritization approaches for invasive species suppression, restoration approaches for intractable invasive species, and native plant material evaluation and establishment. He has served as the president of the Mid-Atlantic Exotic Pest Plant Council and currently serves as president of the Northeastern Weed Science Society. He also operates a small company with a complement of one. 
providing such stewardship services as herbicide application and restoration planning, serving public and private landowners. Now, Dave tells me that he and Art are going to be tag teaming tonight, so I will turn things over to Dave. He's going to kick things off. Are you ready, Dave? I'm good. Okay, I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn off my video, and I will turn things over to you. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction, Andrew, and welcome, everyone. Great to be here for our advanced level series. So on behalf of Art and myself, welcome. And we're going to jump right into this. As Andrew mentioned, we're going to kind of switch back and forth on and off here on some different topics. So what we're going to try to cover here are uh, STEM applications. I'm going to cover that section there. Then I'm going to turn it over to Art for foliar soil and pre-emergent applications. And then we're going to wrap things up with a bunch of different scenarios and different situations concerning native as well as invasive plants. And then, of course, as usual, open up at the end for Q&A. So I will mention that uh, in on behalf of how much time we have, we're really not going to get into a lot of the whys so much as we're going to try to really cover the hows here. But certainly we can answer those kinds of things uh, in the Q&A in the latter half an hour here. So I wanted to just give you a quick slide to introduce this. And this is stuff a lot of us already know and are familiar with. I introduced this in the introductory level course, but competing in invasive plants. So why are they uh, something we need to be concerned about? They diminish species diversity. So that reduction in biodiversity, they degrade wildlife habitats, which will be a biggie with this um, particular clientele that you're working with, slow or inhibit regeneration development, limit future timber potential, which probably won't be as important with a lot of folks, but certainly is an issue that I'm concerned with as a forester and working with extension. So let's jump right in. These are the applications we're going to cover. So cut surface applications include the axe frill or more affectionately known as hack and squirt, injection, stump treatments, and then bark applications. We'll, I'll go over basal bark for you. So a frill is simply a downward angled cut. So you can see the equipment, hatchet, spray bottle, that's how it gets its name, hack and squirt. Uh, typically, um, you're uh, using this to control individual trees, generally you know, over an inch in diameter. You're filling the cuts until the herbicide is uh, you know, just coming out the cuts. If it's running down the stem, move on to the next one. Um, stems less than an inch, simply breaking them over or use the hatchet to, uh, to get them broken, leave some bark intact right here. You can spray that cut surface. So really it's an application that works well for uh, many different size stems from the largest trees to small stuff like this, even less than an inch. So space cuts, one per inch is typically the rule of thumb. And of course that's gonna uh, be a little bit dependent upon the size of the, uh, the hatchet that you're using. Some folks I know do this with a machete, um, but either way, the important point that we wanna make here is that we're leaving space cuts. The cuts need to penetrate through the bark. And really you'll see on a lot of labels that you're treating the cambium layer, but you need to understand the cambium layer is really just a division layer. And really what you're treating is the xylem and the phloem. So the phloem turns into the outer bark ultimately and into bark and the xylem is the sapwood. And that's really where we wanna get the herbicide into that phloem, into the xylem. The xylem's gonna move it downwards. I'm sorry, the xylem's gonna move it up in the tree with the water and the phloem is gonna move it downwards to the roots. And by leaving spaced cuts, really what we're doing is that we're leaving that phloem intact and we're gonna allow that herbicide then to move downwards in that stem to control the roots. This is not preferred. You'll see it on some herbicide labels where it'll actually say to do a complete girdle on the stem. We do not recommend that because again, you're destroying that phloem layer. Uh, you're cutting that layer and you're preventing the downward movement of that herbicide to the root. So, so space cuts is really important. 
So when can these be applied? You know, do not apply during periods of heavy sap flow. Like you see, this is a red maple stem. You cut into the stem and you see the water just coming out of it. The sap just coming out down the stem. You better go do something else that day because no herbicides going into that stem. And then my colleague to the north there in New York, Peter Smolage advises that, you know, dead of winter, when you've got stems just solidly frozen, it's not advisable to do at that time of year as well. Uh, this is some data from a study that I did year round every other month applications on a number of different species, but this is just the red maple data, but you can clearly tell, you know, here's that April sap flow window. It did not work at all, you know, 50% control on average. And then look at with all the other months from June right on through December, 100% control with various uh, herbicide applications and really started in February where you started to see some reduction in control there. So that's really important. So really we're typically looking at a window from about June to December with these kinds of applications. So what are we using here as far as your know, equipment? And I'll, I'll start over here. So a lot of folks like these pump up kinds of spray bottles here. I really prefer the trigger spray bottle. I don't wanna have to stop and pump this thing, but they are available for you to utilize. Uh, this is my hatchet that I use. I actually have ground the bit down so that I make more cuts because I have a narrower blade, but I'm treating almost exactly half the circumference of this tree. It also really helps to create more of a cup effect. And so that narrow blade is going to allow me to really hold that herbicide into the cut better. So this is what I use. It is a little bit heavier. I found if you're treating large trees with a little thicker bark, this, this heavier hatchet versus something like this right here is a lot easier to utilize. The herbicides that we're talking about, some real common active ingredients, all with forest labels. Uh, glyphosate, at least a 41% active ingredient glyphosate. Uh, we found that 50% pretty standard solution in water. Uh, the water-based tricomplers like the amine formulations or choline formulations at a 50% solution. And then a mazapir, if you're using the concentrate like uh, Polaris AC or Arsenal AC, you're in that four to six ounce per gallon. Uh, range. So this amazapir, you got to be aware that this does have a lot of soil activity. So you don't want it running out of those cuts and down onto the ground. It could be taken up. But uh, for your money, this is actually the cheapest product to use because you're only mixing six ounces in a gallon versus 64 with some of these other products. So very expensive product to purchase, but at the use rate, it is actually the most economical. And hack and squirt treatments in general have been shown to be the least expensive manual herbicide application based on a number of forest service studies. So if for difficult to control species, a few additional frills and herbicide in these cuts on the root flare or in any exposed roots can really be helpful. Uh, red maple, for example, is notorious for stump sprouting uh, after you've hack and squirted it. Uh, root suckering species, this is a black gum. Some forest service work recommends additional hacks in the root flares on that species as well. If you have a large job to do, uh, using a backpack sprayer with the gun jet spray gun on it, where you're just pumping up some pressure in your backpack, it allows you to carry a gallon versus a little quart bottle. So you're not going back to the vehicle to fill up so often. So that might be an option for free as well. So what about hack and squirt versus stem injection? So, so this is a hypo hatchet. Uh, it has your, you carry the herbicide on your belt. It's attached to the end of the, the hatchet with a hose. Uh, there's a plunger mechanism in the back of the hatchet head. So when you strike the tree, the herbicide, a calibrated amount comes out the ports automatically. Much different mechanism in this. This is the, I'm supposed to say EZ, not EX, EZ jacked lance. Uh, this actually uses, believe it or not, 22 capsules. So the capsules are, uh, are cartridges. They're filled with herbicide with a wax coating over the surface. They're placed in the back of this handle here. And you basically put this against a tree and give it a, 
a quick shove forward and it inserts one of those 22 capsules or cartridges through the bark. Doesn't There's no powder, there's no bullet or anything. It's just an empty cartridge filled with herbicide and it inserts that cartridge through the bark. So thin bark trees and eventually that, that herbicide will leach into that stem. I can tell you, you can buy a hatchet and a squirt bottle for probably under 50 bucks. And uh, you can see the price tags on some of these things. Uh, you know, I've, I've never used one and I'm not sure it's worth the money because I've killed thousands of trees just using a hatchet and a squirt bottle. But I did want to mention that I have seen a contractor that used nothing but a hypo hatchet and was very happy with the investment that he made. So we'll move on to stump treatments. So we're looking at water soluble treatments versus oil soluble herbicides here. So with water soluble products, we're treating that sapwood layer as well as that phloem or inner bark layer. Again, you'll see it on the label where it'll say to treat the cambium, but the cambium again is just a division layer. We wanna treat that sapwood and that inner bark. Uh, we're gonna treat these immediately after they're cut. So you have that fresh cut surface. You're brushing the sawdust off and you're applying the herbicide to it, much different than the oil uh, products. So if you're mixing herbicide in, in an oil, then you're spraying, again, that sapwood, but you're also treating the sides of the stump as well as the root flare and versus water where you have to treat immediately. If you can find that stump, you can come back and treat it anytime after it's been cut because you're treating the sides of the stump. It's if, if it's even stump sprouted already, uh, you can come back and treat it. So these are practices used. So when you cut something, you don't want it to re-sprout. And many of the, the problem plants that we're contending will, will re-sprout vigorously if you do not treat that stump in some way. Small stumps, you're just spraying that whole surface. This is an autumn olive shrub that I cut. You're treating all those stems. So stump treatments can be very expensive and very labor intensive by comparison because you have this intensive two-step process where you have someone with a chainsaw and all the gear that goes with that where you're cutting stems and then another guy coming back behind that, finding the stumps and treating them. And so it's a very time consuming and uh, labor intensive process. Uh, most times in our forest applications, we're not cutting down stems, we're leaving them stand unless for some reason it's a aesthetic thing or a hazardous type of situation where the tree has to be removed. But so many times we can leave these um, dead stems there and just let them decompose naturally. So just like our hack and squirt, if you cut that stem off and you see water coming out of the stump, you better go do something else that day because it's not likely to work. In particular with water-based applications, uh, we'll talk about basal bark here in a minute, but you could treat during sap flow periods with a basal bark application, this same stem, and then come back and cut it at another time. And you may get away with treating it as a basal bark if you're treating the, the surrounding here uh, bark and the root flares. But again, if there's a lot of water coming out here, it's really just not recommended that time of year to do that. So best June to December for our stump treatments, just like with hack and squirt. Here's an, an interesting approach here. This is one of our local contractors looking at more of an integrated approach to stump treatments, where believe it or not, he's carrying a backpack sprayer right here with the wand coming down right here, as well as the saw here with a saw blade on the end of, of a heavy duty weed eater. He's cutting off the stem and then immediately treating it. Uh, he was actually using an oil-based product that day, but he was immediately treating uh, those stems as uh, he was moving through the wood. So a little integrated approach and a little time saver that way if you could do something like that. So stump treatments, here's some of the herbicides. So uh, very similar to what we would use for hack and squirt, but we've added this product right here. So the triclopyr ester formulations uh, at a 20% solution in basil oil. And you can see that treatment right here. So this stem has been completely treated. Even some of these sprouts here, you can see they've been treated with the oil versus this where we're just treating that sapwood and inner bark layer here with the water-based products. 
So basal bark treating uh, thin bark trees, generally less than six inches in basal diameter. So you're spraying that lower 12 to 15 inches of the trunk uh, completely around the stem there. So that's a basal bark application. So if you can get your wand into even multi-stem shrubs, uh, basal bark applications can be very effective if you can reach the center and, and spray those stems. So these can be applied based on the label any time of year, including winter months. So it gives you a, a big window of opportunity to do basal bark applications. Although we typically recommend avoiding that time after leaf drop um, right to the, the solstice window that we're, we're moving to now where we can start to go back out and do these treatments again. Because that's a time of year when those stems are just completely dormant. You would make your application and basically that product would just sit there until you started to get some sap movement uh, inside that stem. And then it would begin to move that product certainly. But uh, you know, the label is recommending that these applica applications can be made year round. I wanted to point out one difference in the label here. So uh, there's two different basal bark treatments that you'll see on product labels, triclopyr ester labels, uh, to the traditional high volume, I'll say basal bark applications um, versus the low volume basal bark application. So the difference here is with low volume or applying uh, smaller amounts of a very concentrated product, 20 to 30% versus this at one to five percent. The difference here is that you're spraying until you have runoff at the ground line. And then with the low volume, do not spray to the point of runoff. So if you can truly make low volume applications and you're not one of those that thinks that more is always better, then go out at these higher rates um, where you have a higher concentrated uh, product in your mix. Um, but I have done work, you know, these 5% rates can be effective, but again, you're, you're applying more product out there. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that you have a maximum use rate on forestry sites. And so some areas you may go off label, you're only allowed up to six quarts of triclopyr active ingredient per acre. And so at these high rates with a lot of stems per acre, uh, you can very easily uh, exceed the six quarts per acre per year on the label requirement. So be aware of that. So going out at lower rates, you know, 10% is where the forest service has landed with a lot of these might save you from exceeding this uh, label rate. So your equipment that you need for basal bark, uh, the low volume uh, basal wand, this is what I use, the B&G extended band. It has a drip proof uh, valve. So it has a cable that runs the full length of the wand and shuts it right off here at the tip so you're not dripping anything on the ground between uh, applications. Uh, you use a very small aperture nozzle Y3 for your colder times of year, or if you're using vegetable based um, oils that are a little bit thicker, or even down to as small as a Y2 or Y1 nozzle. Uh, shut down almost completely, uh, pump the pressure up in your backpack spray, and it's basically like using a can of spray paint when you spray those stems, and you can make some very efficient applications that way with very low volume treatments. Uh, again, here we're using triclopyr ester, so just like what we would use for the oil-based treatments on stumps, and I'm going to suggest that we can go out anywhere from 10 to 20 percent you're making those low volume applications you're up here if you tend to spray a little bit heavier then then go at a lower rate and you're mixing them in basil oil so you can purchase basil oils commercially available basil oils and either mineral based or vegetable based formulations depending on what your client might demand from you and then time of year comes into play because you're only going to be able to spray the vegetable based oils during the time of year when it's warm out. Otherwise, it just gets too thick to go through the nozzle. Um, so warm weather vegetable-based oils can be very effective. So just uh, my last slide here, just to give you a warning here. So herbicides um, can potentially spread to adjoining trees of the same species by root graft. So restricting treatments to species different from the leaf trees will minimize the potential for damage. So be aware of those root grafts potentially between same species. 
So triclopyr has been uh, shown to be not translocated well in plants and will not impact nearby trees of the same species. So use a 50% solution of triclopyr herbicide in water or a 10 to 20% in basil oil when releasing same species from each other with any of these methods, stump treatment, basil bark, or hack and squirt. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna let Art jump on here with his presentation now for the first part. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to cover foliar application and soil application, emphasizing pre-emergence type treatments, touching on soil spot treatments as well. As Dave indicated, what we're gonna do is try to be pretty basic in this part with the hope that the questions will determine uh, the detail coming later. So as far as this section, I'm gonna cover high volume, low volume, introduce you to the concept of ultra low volume foliar applications, talk about pre-emergence herbicide applications, uh, and briefly touch on soil spot. So this is a, a typical high volume application. The applicator in this case is treating Japanese knotweed. This is what you would also refer to as spray to wet. Same thing here, knotweed again. Um, the app, and, and you know, notice both of these situations, you're using this method for taller, denser vegetation. And this is what we mean by high volume or spray to wet. You know, the, the recommendation is always spray just before the point of runoff, but you know, when, when it's dripping off, stop, because at that point, it's not doing you any good anymore to add additional material, but you're completely saturating that leaf surface. You were looking at a honeysuckle, here it is on a rhododendron. Low volume foliar, different approach. Here, really your objective is to put on as little material as practical. So what you're looking now for in terms of that finished application is discrete droplets. And this is more appropriate, more easily implemented with backpack type sprayers. So this would be the same plants we were looking at before, but that low volume approach to the honeysuckle, I mean, you can see the individual droplets. Same thing with that rhododendron. You can see the individual droplets, they're discrete. And really what your objective as an applicator is to learn how to get uniform coverage over that plant over time with and practice with fewer and fewer dots. Now, this is what ultra low volume looks like. And operationally, it's not like, okay, below 10, we're gonna call it ultra low volume. Really, this is kind of a term used to describe a specific technology called Thinbert that I'll get into in a minute. As far as equipment to implement your foliar applications, this would be one basic version. And this is keeping in mind you in the audience might be contemplating getting some of this equipment, engaging in this um, as a commercial enterprise, oh, maybe just for your own entertainment. So I'm not gonna talk about getting a, you know, a giant truck uh, with a thousand gallon tank. So look at a situation like this, where you have a UTV, it's not unusual for them to have about a thousand pounds of payload capacity. This is a 50 gallon sprayer. So you can kind of look at that and say, all right, if I fill that up, I'm a little over eight, about 825 pounds of water. You know, so if the, if the whole sprayer isn't too much over 200 pounds, you could put something like this just on the back of a UTV. You've got 50 gallons of capacity, that hose reel, depending on the, the type, you're, you could be up to 500 feet. So in a fairly compact package, you can have a lot of utility and be doing applications like this. Now, in this case, you have a larger capacity sprayer in the back of a pickup truck. Although once again, in this case, this has about 500 feet of hose. This would be a typical high volume gun. And, and what makes it high volume is, is a high flow rate. You know, we're talking multiple gallons per minute. You start adjusting the orifice or nozzle size on these guns, you can easily be approaching an excess of five gallons per minute of flow, which also then means you need a fairly large pump behind it. So that's why you're looking at motorized sprayers to efficiently do high volume applications. Now, as you start moving down towards this electric pump sprayer and backpack sprayers, 
that's when it's more practical to start thinking about low volume applications. Um, here's a case where this is that same sprayer we just looked at, um, but now you're seeing that it has two off center flat fan nozzles set up in the back. So this can create a fixed pattern. And in case this, this is a vehicle used at one of the state parks here in PA, it puts out a 22 foot pattern at about eight gallons per acre. So with a, even with a 25 gallon tank, they're treating over three acres of parking lot. So that's one of the key advantages of low volume application is just tremendous productivity. You spend a lot more time spraying and a lot less time mixing. Here's just a, a sample of different application equipment you could use. And most of this is oriented towards foliar, um, but we have a, Left to right, you've got a soil spot gun. You've got the squirt bottle Dave spoke about. You have a pump type sprayer in the center, that's solo. Um, next to it, the smaller, about a liter and a half pump type sprayer that uh, we were talking about for those hack and squirt applications. And all the way on the right is your very basic solo backpack. Let's take a look at a basic backpack. They're gonna have a piston or a diaphragm pump because you need a pump that you can actuate with a lever. Um, that's why it's piston or diaphragm. Typical arrangement then is you have in the neighborhood of four to five feet of hose terminating in a wand and that trigger valve on the wand is what is controlling the flow from the pump to the target. Very basic nozzle end here. So um, this is an adjustable cone nozzle. Let's disassemble it a little bit. So what you should have is some type of filtration at the back end, if you will, or the upstream end, then you have the nozzle cone itself, the cap, wand end cap holding that in place, and then the adjustable part, the cap of that adjustable cone. So that's a very basic inexpensive version. If you, you can buy equipment like this and the easiest, most effective first upgrade you should make other than maybe a, set, a, a comfort harness to replace the simple shoulder straps um, would be to replace nozzles. And you don't even need to replace the wand. So in this case, you can replace that stock plastic adjustable cone nozzle with this brass T-jet system and replace that hemispherical screen with a check valve. An adjustable cone nozzle gives you that range so that you can go from a straight stream to this wide hollow cone and all settings in between just by manually turning the barrel of that cone. Kind of the next step up to maybe give you a lot of flexibility and utility with a simple backpack sprayer is to now go to a constant flow valve. Difference being from what you saw before is we're inserting that constant flow valve on the end of the wand downstream of the screen and then mounting your nozzle. The constant flow valve is literally that. It fix, fixes the pressure regardless of how much pressure is behind it. So your output pressure is always the same, which means your flow rate is always going to be the same. So it's very useful for band type applications if you're treating fence lines or under guide rails, pardon me, um, you know, parking bumpers, just anything where you would really like a uniform strip in anywhere where I mean, uniformity is always great. So if you're making a small scale broadcast type application, having the, the, the sprayer itself, the wand control the flow rather than you just becoming artful with uh, manipulating the wand, it's gonna give you a more consistent application. And one thing to stress, even with a solo sprayer, that nozzle end cap that you see here, the black thing in the center, that will accommodate pretty much any standard type of T-jet spray tip in there, whether it's the adjustable cone you see or an off-center flat fan or an even spray. Um, you can, based on whatever you wanna do, you can put them in that sprayer and not have to worry about upgrading that wand. If you're gonna talk about upgrading a backpack, you know, this might be where you, you head. Um, this is a, a more expensive unit, piston pump unit. This is a Birchmeyer. The wand has been replaced with a handgun. <clears throat> um, notice that the, the stock straps have been replaced by a comfort harness, which on a Birchmeyer takes a little bit of work. 
I like the handgun for the, the ergonomics of it. In this case, um, you, you're still be able to mount any type of T-Jet nozzle you want, really any kind of nozzle, but T-Jet's kind of an industry standard. Um, in this case, that screen is now on the upstream or inlet side of that gun and just with those quick jet fittings. Here's that thin vert system I talked about or that ultra low volume setup. The difference here is this is a, a proprietary system of a specific carrier where you are buying this oil or oil mixture, mixing it with water, creating a, a thicker invert emulsion liquid and then a specialized nozzle. So this nozzle you see in this image is about $120. The advantage is, is if you're going to do a lot of spraying, just for instance, the difference between an I'm spraying with water in a low volume setting and that thin vert setting is I can go four times as far with the same volume. So once you start, once you have the volume of work that mixing is for you time wasted, that's when that investment in that the more expensive carrier and the nozzle might be worthwhile. But once again, this is what ultra low volume coverage would look like. So here, targeting five gallons per acre. When we were talking about high volume, that's usually in excess of 100. And a typical low volume application for me would be 20 gallons per acre. Just another view of ultra low volume. There's little white dots on that thistle. Stepping up a little bit, you can look at now motorized units. We have a mist blower on the left and a motorized backpack on the right. The difference here, the mist blower, what the motor is doing is creating a concentrated airstream and then injecting your fluid into that airstream for dispersal. The motorized backpack is just basically a motorized version of what you were wearing before, but instead of you pumping it, the motor's running the pump for you. Mist blower application here, this would be an early season pre-emergence application um, to suppress Japanese stilt grass. But what mist blowers let you do is treat irregular areas around obstacles, um, depending on how you use them. I mean, we have an applicator, in fact, Dave showed a picture of him. He gets about a 55 foot swath when he's using a mist blower. Um, so you can cover a tremendous amount of area. Um, and at very low volumes. I mean, there are applicators using mist blowers down to two gallons per acre. Another move, kind of moving away and back towards the, the, the higher volume realm. Um, this is I mean, it's typically called a turf gun or a chemlon gun, but it's a shower head type pattern. And it's actually pretty useful for doing pre-emergent or soil applications. Here's a unit that's got two reels, one on each side, so crews can either direction but this is what that looks like in action you see the yellowish spray coming out this is a, in this case a pendimethalin application for mile a minute but because of that shower head pattern and with a little bit of practice once again it gives you the the opportunity to fairly evenly cover irregular areas if you're treating a more regular area or want a in this case, a motorized fixed pattern application. We can do pre-emergent applications. Um, you can certainly do it with your backpack. Um, in this case, it's a fixed pattern and, that I described before uh, for treating parking lots. We're not gonna go into calibration. Uh, I'm hoping we'll get some questions about it. I just wanna stress that you have to do it. Um, a, it's going to help you stay on label to deliver the dose that you want to deliver. Um, and also, particularly if you're in a larger organization or sharing information with other people, you know, your idea of what coverage is with a 2% solution um, might not translate well to another applicator. But so by going through the process of calibrating, determining fairly precisely how much liquid you are applying to a unit area and then being able to mix your herbicide for that unit area is gonna give you much better precision. And I'll just wrap up here talking a little bit about spot soil applications. It's really kind of a niche application and it's, um, it's not for the faint of heart because you're using here very soil active materials that you're applying at the base of woody plants. 
and they're being killed by root pickup, which means if you're choosing targets that are sharing roots with things that you didn't want to injure, that can be problematic. But you dose it based on the canopy width or the stem diameter of the plant in question, and the application looks similar to that. It does give you the advantage of being away from the base. This, this, is, a material, this is a method that's one of the uh, common applications is with multiflora rows and pasture situations. And just finally, to, just to touch on gear a little bit. I mean, this, for better or for worse, this is my setup here. I have two backpack sprayers. I have the 25 gallon tank for mixing. Um, notice I do reuse, according to label, um, two and a half gallon jugs. Notice lots and lots of containment. Do all mixing in containment, do all dispensing in containment. Dave, back to you. All right, we're gonna shift gears a little bit here. I know that was quick and dirty, so uh, we'll answer your question certainly at the end. We're gonna move into some different situations that you might encounter and give you some application behind them. So I just wanna open with a few statements here. So the treatments need to be part of a plan. So they need to be something that's written into objectives for what the landowner needs to do to manage their property the way they wish. Uh, we're going to use herbicides in our scenarios. So when and where they're appropriate, landowner's approval done by a certified applicator or with supervision. Um, a couple other points here I'll make is that uh, all of these applications are based on the number and the size of the stems that you're treating. So what are the targets? How many acres you need to treat? How many acres you need to cover? Are there non-targets present? that you don't want to control? Um, and can you be very selective in your treatment so that you don't affect non-targets? And that includes you know, the, the wildlife and the pollinators and those kind of things. I saw one of the questions around that area. So uh, one of the things I will note very quickly here and the images that have been shared so far, everybody had the proper PPE on. So that was part of what we were supposed to cover. So I wanted you to note in this image, this is me, I had a short sleeve shirt on. So I needed my long sleeve shirt to be meeting the personal protective equipment uh, requirements here. So I'm gonna talk about some of our charming natives here that can be very problematic depending on the particular situation that you're dealing with. So uh, I know this might shock some folks here and I may get a few questions as to why, but I'm gonna uh, mention that some of our understory species like striped maple, uh, American beech, black birch, red maple, and some others there can be problematic in our understory depending on the specific situation that you're dealing with and the landowner's objective. And they can be controlled and sometimes they need to be controlled. Typically, we're looking at stem treatments, hack and squirt, basal bark applications. And both of these are actually treating understories uh, in oak that were just black birch multiple, multiple stems of black birch. But we might have situations like this due to beech bark disease, for example, we have understories that are just thickets of American beech and here striped maple in the understory. So these create very shady understories, very poor wildlife habitat, those kinds of situations. So how are we gonna handle this was a red maple uh, treatment underneath a white oak stand where the red maple is very shade tolerant and casts a lot of dense shade on the understory here. Uh, so there's a situation that needed to be treated. Uh, here's creating a snag tree using hack and squirt uh, for a wildlife snag tree on a less desirable species that uh, they were okay with sacrificing uh, for their objective. And over here, believe it or not, this is a walnut stem that was very heavily cankered and that tree was hack and squirted to control it to release a native crab apple tree because they wanted to maintain the early successional habitat there. So this is the crab apple stem right here that was overtopped by the walnut. This is what it might look like. These have all been basal bark treated. This was a uh, beech brush as a result of beech bark disease causing the tree to send up root suckers. Uh, this is uh, actually a picture of my brother on his property in Western New York treating those beech stems. Uh, his objective was to uh, get sunlight back into that understory and create a better deer habitat there actually. 
in this stem, you can see the light that's coming in here, but these understory stems have all been treated. These smaller stems here have all been treated with hack and squirt. And you can see the amount of light that is now reaching the forest floor. We don't see a, a response yet, but you can see there was literally nothing growing in this understory because it was so dense and shady. And so there's a, a, you know, a treatment that can help with that. So I'm going to hit upon grapevines and you can see, you know, the weight of grapevines, you get snow, you get ice on these things and that can destroy a lot of trees, particularly when they're young, particularly in young stands that are trying to regenerate. So these vines can be treated as well. And you know, I, I'll, I'll preface all of this with a caveat that I'm not talking a blanket recommendation of controlling any and all. For example, right here, uh, this might be just the absolute perfect tree to keep a grape arbor on from a wildlife perspective. You know, these all have to be guided by the landowner's objective. But when it's growing up your prize tree here, that's just a tremendous invaluable stem. And maybe you, you wanna keep this stem growing and healthy. These vines can really strangle those stems. So treating this with a basal bark application can be very effective. But honestly, most times when we're treating great vines, we're just cutting them. Uh, this is one of our consultant foresters in Pennsylvania. He invested in this really neat battery powered uh, chainsaw with just a four inch bar here. Uh, carries a spare battery with him, some bar oil. And when he's out doing his work on uh, people's property, he's just cutting these grapevines. They're re-sprouting and he's just allowing the deer to browse on those sprouts, but it's getting those stems out of those canopies. This is another very problematic species in our state in Pennsylvania here, where we can have understories that are full of these rhizominous ferns. So hay scented in New York, they're ferns that send up single fronds from a root system called a rhizome. And we can have complete understories of these ferns that are basically wildlife deserts. There's nothing else growing in this understory from a wildlife perspective. And they can be very inhibitive of forest regeneration. They grow very dense like this. Small patches can be very easily treated. This is just a low volume uh, backpack sprayer application and a small patch of fern in a forest opening. Uh, bigger areas, as Art mentioned, you know, you're using a backpack mist blow or something like this here to treat uh, larger patches of fern in a woodlot. And these are uh, treatments that are made very selectively with a herbicide uh, that uh, active ingredient is sulfometron. We haven't mentioned that yet, but that's a very selective product. Uh, it does have soil residual, but it won't impact any of these trees or even advanced seedling regeneration and its apply, but it will control other herbaceous plants if present. So you need to be aware of that, but it's very effective at controlling fern, but can be done in a very selective way. This is what it looks like after it's sprayed. And you oftentimes you'll find these little seedlings that were underneath there that you didn't even know were present in that carpet of fern. And then here's another site where the fern, you can see how dense it can get and how dark and shaded it can be underneath there and all the regeneration that has popped up. These are just thousands and thousands of seedlings uh, just waiting to get that sunlight that have now germinated after the fern was controlled. So I'm going to stop there, Art, and let you jump back on with your invasive uh, plants here. All right, buckle your seatbelts, everybody. <laughs> Dave and I decided ahead of time we were going to try to limit our content to 60 minutes total, which says by 8.03 I should be done. Let's see. Um, because we want to leave plenty of time for questions and delving into the details that you want. Um, I think one of the key things to, to build on what Dave said uh, as far as the landowner's objectives, but when you're prioritizing your work, particularly with, well, what, I guess it doesn't really matter whether it's silvicultural, um, habitat management. One of the things I would stress is it might be a little counterintuitive, but with invasive species work, we, we protect the best. We work from good sites towards bad, which might seem like your reaction might be, no, I wanna go where it's worst and work there. But your time and effort is better spent keeping good areas good, converting moderate areas to better um, before you plunge into sort of like, you know, the inner circle of Hades trying to do work there. Um, you can much more efficiently keep 
ecologically sound areas, ecologically sound, um, than by investing time in places that are heavily, heavily disrupted and impaired. Um, I'm gonna, when we do, I do a lot of my work with the state park system here. We have this prioritization system that's made up of several indices, including two indices just about the land unit itself will break a park up into subunits, but you're looking at the ecological intactness or integrity of a given unit. Um, we also look at its public relations value or its outreach value. Um, so that if that site's gonna educate park visitors by them seeing the work, you know, that's gonna give it a higher priority. Um, but we're also looking at the extent of the species. And again, it might be counterintuitive, but higher values go to the leading edge of infestations rather than that dark fiery center. There's also an impact value, which is kind of a bonus point based on how species are adapted to particular sites. What I really wanna stress is this idea of restoration effort. Um, if you look at this chart, and this is just a very generalized version of that y-axis is effort, the x-axis is time. And what you really wanna do is move, particularly if you look at that reddish curve labeled three, I mean, everything starts high effort, but what, what we would like to be able to do is move to a point where our continuing efforts are fairly low in intensity. It's going to be ongoing. You know, one of the things that uh, I guess we haven't stressed yet, but maybe you already understand intuitively that um, natural resource management, I mean, it's a perpetual endeavor. So um, for those of you thinking of this commercially, that's good. Um, for those of you that are managing your own property, it's good too, because it's fun and it's fulfilling and it's wholesome. But to stress here, you know, we're assigning these index values because at the end of the day, the higher score is better. I want that three scenario where when I visit that site and do a couple operations, I've got that site into a maintenance mode. That effort is down close to the x-axis. Worst case, I'm looking at that zero value. And you know, some of our annual species where you have this persistent seed bank and you come back year after year and they keep coming up and they keep coming up in a similar density to what they came before, that's not really sustainable. You know, you doing the same work on the same spot for the same result year after year is actually a low priority effort. So I just wanted to stress that that's a big factor and it really goes back to what I said before about working from better areas towards more impacted areas. But we end up with a chart like this where the rows represent target species, the columns are target units within a property, in this case, a state park, and where we have that higher value closer to 10, that's where we're gonna prioritize our efforts. As far as tools we're gonna to think about for this scenarios here, um, glyphosate is a primary tool. We've got brand examples of Rodeo and Aquanite, but it, it's, it's an off patent product. You can find dozens of potential products. Triclopyramine is also off patent um, and common products would be Vastland, which is a newer product um, or Garlon 3A. Triclopyr ester, Dave has discussed, you can get that as Garlon 4 Ultra, Pathfinder, and a number of generics, both in the ready to use and the concentrate form. And we're gonna talk a little bit about pre-emergent herbicides too. There's a number of them. We'll just use pendimethalin as a good starting point. Labels of glyphosate, just to confirm there really are a lot of them. Um, and for the work that I do, I'm always looking for aquatic labeled products. So like back here with the glyphosate products, these are all aquatic labeled and there's more. These are three examples of aquatic labeled triclopyr products. Um, the one on the right is kind of new and different. That's Tricera. It's actually an acid formulation. So it's, what it's actually soluble in, I don't know, but it mixes in water, it mixes in oil, it takes all of the water soluble triclopyr labeling and a lot of the ester form triclopyr labeling and puts it into one product. These are the triclopyr ester products that Dave mentioned for stem treatment. Basic prescriptions then for most spot treatments 
Um, I prefer to combine materials because one of the things I would stress, particularly once you get into the meat of the season, is you don't want to tie your hands with a limited prescription. You want to be able to treat all the potential target stems and plants you can identify. This glyphosate plus triclopyr mixture, um, it, it, it strikes a good balance between being a very potent mixture, but also being moderately idiot proof, um, minimal soil activity, aquatic labeled ingredients. So really the only way you're going to impact things you wanted to preserve is by accidentally treating them. Um, we get into the materials Dave discussed for hack and treat and stump treatments as well. Um, and just at the bottom, just stressing that uh, when we get into this idea of treating annuals with pre-emergent treatments, we're going to use pendimethalin as an example. These are just product rates per acre. So my basic mix for that spot treatment is going to be three quarts of rodeo per acre plus two quarts of vast lamb. Um, that's a pretty stiff mix. But once again, I don't want to have to walk by stuff or be limited by, by what I've taken out into the field with me. And um, I, I tend to take the attitude, if I see a target that's more susceptible, I can actually spray it a little bit lighter to adjust that dosage if I need to. I wanna talk a little bit about this idea of plant growth forms and how it impacts when you're gonna do your work. Um, the orange bars represent when you're gonna do herbicide work. As we look at the different rows, the life forms that we have here, you have annual species. Uh, we break the biennials actually into their first year and second. Herbaceous perennials are kind of lumped together, whether they're, if you will, taprooted types or, or creeping types. An important distinction here is we're going to separate the idea of non-suckering woody species and suckering woody species as two completely different entities. And then finally talk about woody vines. Now, we'll shorten that up because this is what we're going to address with some example species. Annuals, non-suckering woody plants, suckering woody plants, and woody vines. Let's talk about annuals. The two rows you see, we can do pre-emergence or post-emergence applications. Some common examples would be Japanese stiltgrass, Japanese hops, mile a minute, among others. Um, you might be seeing small carpet grass where you are now. Let's kind of take a look at, for instance, mile minute in, in its operational calendar. You know, we're in the window now, or if it's warmer, you might be seeing this germinate already. Um, we've sort of settled on April 1st where we are, although the last several springs have been cool and it's coming up later. So the top above that calendar timeline is sort of the phenology below is the, are the operations. If it's not up yet, you can be doing pre-emergence applications. You can even be still be doing them as long as there's some part in that mixture that will address that emerged shoot, uh, which we would, in this case, we'll call pre-post. Once they're up and, and recognizable, you could use a post-emergence treatment. And with, with any of these annuals, you can use mechanical treatments. So for instance, mile a minute, you can pull. What I'll stress here, this timeline is ending in June because once you get to July, you're gonna have ripe seed and you've sort of missed that critical control objective. Stilt grass is a little different. The emergence time is similar. So that pre-emergence and pre-post timing is the same, but it's not going to set seed until the end of August. So we have a longer operational window. And it's not, and the post-emergence application and the pulling don't line up quite as much because it's easier to pull when you let it get a little bit bigger and actually self-thin a little bit rather than going out and trying to pick little one-inch plants. We discussed that. This is what a pre-emergence application could look like. Uh, in this case, using a Chemlon gun. If you're not treating vast areas, a backpack sprayer works fine, mist blower, but those would be methods to make that pre-emergence application. If you're spot treating annuals, the key is gonna be, particularly say with mile a minute, do it when it's small, do it when it's discreet so that you're not affecting broad swaths of area to get a few plants. So that was that first shot was you know typical of May. You're kind of getting towards the end of May, maybe into June with that one. They're still discrete. They're not climbing all other over all other targets. 
Let's transition to non-suckering woody plants, um, exotic shrubs, trees, Norway maple, European alder, polonia. Yes, I know, I forgot to list calorie pear, but I do list it later. These are all non-suckering plants. Key point here is if you can control all the stem tissue, it doesn't matter if the roots are alive. Um, you've basically controlled that plant. So you have barberry, your honeysuckles, multiflora rose, privets, autumn olive, glossy buckthorn, burning bush. This time I've got calorie pear listed in there. So those would be targets. Here's the timetable for that. You can look at the stem treatments that Dave described. So cutting and stump treating, basil bark, hack and squirt if you can get at it. These are you know, Dave gave you some caveats and for instance, quite often said June to December is the ideal window. But you do have that option of doing those stem treatments throughout the year. And your own experience is gonna dictate, you know, you might say, okay, sure. It turns out I can go out the first week of February and do this, um, but when it's 15 degrees, I've decided it's not very much fun, you know. So those sort of things factor in. Now, as far as the foliar applications, that's a much more defined window. And even with exotic shrubs that leaf sooner and drop leaves later, I would still recommend, and I probably have to be careful because this is calibrated towards central Pennsylvania. What I've sort of settled on as my go signal to start treating exotic shrubs with foliar treatments is when multiflora rose flowers, which in our part of the world is usually first week of June. So just emphasizing, you, you do have a year long option with stem treatments on these non-suckering woody species, June through let's say into October with your foliar treatment. Now let's switch to suckering species. So big difference, the non-suckering, the stem is our target. The suckering species were after the roots. Um, we can kill the stems all day until the sun explodes, but if we don't kill the roots, it's going to keep coming back. Two primary examples, tree of heaven in the slide before, and one of my new favorites, Japanese angelica tree, Aurelia elata. So this is what that looks like. It looks just like devil's walking stick, except it grows as an aggressive clonal species instead of a, a really lazy and kind of isolated clonal species. It is from Asia. Kind of hard to tell apart until it flowers. Um, this is the flower of the Japanese angelica tree. Multiple main axes of the inflorescence emanating from one point, whereas the native has a strong central axis in the inflorescence. So here's the key thing. Your window to work on the suckering species, summer. Uh, figure farther south of us, maybe start as soon as mid-June, but really you're looking at July, August, September, because what we're trying to do is control that root system. And the best way to do that is to get herbicide either on the stem or on the, on the relatively intact stem or the foliage and have it translocated to the root system. So that's the window where that's gonna happen most often. So we're targeting the root system. You know, this is this shot here um, is most likely one Alanthus plant, mom in the center and, and all her little babies. So I just wanna stress that stump treatment any kind of girdling treatment is not going to be a recommended method here. We're trying to get material down into the root system and the phloem is a source sink system and the canopy is the source and the root is the sink. And if you eliminate the source, you drastically limit the amount of translocation that occurs to the roots. So don't use stump treatment as a primary tool for suckering species like Alanthus, like Angelica tree or if we need to control black locust or sassafras or sumacs. Um, so here's that window broken down operationally and whether it's foliar, hack and squirt or basil, same window, July through September. What I'll point out is if you get into dense stands, you're definitely gonna to wanna to look at this as two-stage operation and think about doing a foliar first because You've got all ranges of canopy here. You've got the overstory, the midstory, and the understory is all tree of heaven. And you could have hundreds and hundreds of stems 
in one clone and you don't want to stem treat all of those. I mean, you might, but you're crazy. So instead, foliar treat what you can. Example of high volume here. At first glance, you look at that, you say that wasn't very good control, but guess what? Um, and it still doesn't look very good. But when you look underneath, you've probably controlled 95% of the stems and the number that you've left to finish with stem treatment because they were too tall is now measured probably in the dozens. So operationally, doing the two-step operation gets you complete control of that wild thicket of tree of heaven. Just emphasizing that idea of getting the root system. Here's a clone that was split in half and the downhill side was treated by hack and squirt with the space cuts that Dave emphasized. And uphill of the two people here, it was girdled. Same clone, and so different effects. The stems themselves are dead. We're looking at this about nine months later. These were treated in October of one year. This is June the next, sorry, July is what the slide says. Here is that issue. These are stems that were completely girdled. So you can, and in fact, near the top center of the screen, you can see those, the scallops from the treatment. Well, guess what? I mean, above those hacks, it's dead, but you can see new shoots arising on that portion of the stem below the cuts. Because they were girdled, you didn't get any herbicide into that portion of the stem. So the stem is sprouting, the roots are sprouting. Whereas downhill, where the cuts were spaced, you've got translocation into the root system and you turned that Alanthus patch back into the crown batch patch it was. So once again, don't girdle, don't stump tree. All right, let's finish up with vines. Here's the thing about vines, for the most part, not most part, they are, they're suckering woody species, but they're also vines. So they're doubly annoying. So what I'm gonna stress here is this idea of a mechanical plus a foliar. So species like Oriental bittersweet, um, Japanese honeysuckle, wisteria. Let me think, in your part of the world, you probably have a kibia. Um, this is porcelain berry, kudzu. Really think about because they're suckering, but because you can't access that canopy is cutting those vines off at the ground level. You might do a window cut so that you can clearly see separation. Don't pull them out, leave them be. You don't wanna pull stuff down on you. They're gonna dry. They're just not gonna be that much of an issue if you leave them there. Treat the regrowth. It's gotta sprout from the ground where you are. And as Dave mentioned, you might get some brows holding it in check, but basically now you have just sort of these wild rampant shrubs at ground level that you can foliar treat. Key here is, you know, don't cut it on June 1st and come back on June 21st and treat it. You need to give that canopy of those re-sprouts time to develop. So, and, and at this point, this isn't empirically tested. I'm just suggesting you wait at least six weeks if you're cutting them during the growing season. Um, winter would be a great time to do that work. Um, so that summarizes what I wanted to cover and I went five minutes over, but that leaves 22 minutes for questions. Okay, thank you, Art. Thanks, Dave. Uh, great <laughs> stuff. And uh, I certainly appreciate all the great information. Let me uh, share my screen back here so your contact information stays up while we're doing the, uh, the question and answer. And we've had some uh, quite, a, quite a good amount of, uh, of questions in there. Uh, the first question is, is there any chance of these herbicides getting into the water table? I'm gonna handle that one, Art. Sure, I guess I'm about to say one, okay. Um, when you're talking chance, you have to be careful. Um, Let's just say there's a chance. Well, here are the scenarios. Um, if you were on what you would consider a terrestrial site, not typically waterlogged, um, occasion, you know, the, the flow you're gonna have is, okay, it rained a lot and, and maybe we've got moments where that soil infiltration rate isn't quite up to snuff. But you know, if that's the normal condition, um, 
If it's glyphosate, no. Glyphosate binds very tightly to soil. So glyphosate, if it's in water, it will move around. But as soon as it comes into contact with soil, it's immobilized. And even if the soil's mobilized, the glyphosate itself is chemically immobilized. Now, triclopyr, um, amazepyr, they're going to be a little more mobile in the soil. So if you have very permeable soils, a lot of, of rainfall, you're going to see some downward movement. Uh, and then what you're looking at is the balance between they don't have that long of a half-life in the soil. So basically, as soon as they leave the sprayer, the conditions that start their degradation kick in. So they're breaking down while they're moving. So the chances are, let's just say low. With prudent application, you're going to find that you, you, you are keeping within the constraints where you want to work. You're not injuring non-targets. You're not introducing these materials into groundwater, into open surface water. I think the other part of that I would add to is we need to consider the application method. So if that is a concern, there are application methods that can be very selective and very target specific as well. So consider that as a, as a possibility. And the more soil active the ingredient, the more likely it has the potential to even move off site. So, you know, recognize that, you know, active ingredients like glyphosate that bind to soil have, have no soil activity, but something that you need to have around for a while that, that it's going to be picked up by roots as, as a longer option as the possibility of, of moving. Okay, thank you. Wick has a question. How does basil oil differ from seed oil or crop oil? He says, I've had a hard time finding it through my usual suppliers. I don't know those two, Art. Do you know what those are specifically? Well, in terms of composition, it, it might not differ very much. Um, I guess what I would suggest is, I'm going to guess these relying on agricultural distributors. Um, so for them, a basil oil is going to be a specialty product. You know, I would look for distributors like Arbor Chem in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. I'm trying to think what CWC became, but um, for instance, what used to be Timberland and then became, gosh, what did they become? Anyway, now they're Nutrien. Um, there's, but there are a, a few specialized vendors working in the forestry and non-crop market. So I think if you work with them, you'll find that it's very easy to get that material. But, you know, the, the chemical answer to your question, they're not all that different. Um, because basil oils can be anything from 100% oil to mixtures of, of you know, 93% oil and a certain amount of emulsifier to help it mix with other ingredients. But I really would just go to the effort to find a distributor that specializes in that market to really get something that's labeled as a basil oil. And the, I see the comment in the chat, forestry suppliers does likely sell basil oil, but I guarantee you, you can find it for less expensive from some vendors that cater specifically to herbicide products. Okay, thank you. Ron says, I was doing basil bark treatments on a client's property and they asked if there would be impacts on insects and ultimately woodpeckers that fed on the insects in the dead trees. He says, I didn't have an answer for that one. Well, the practical operational answer is no. Um, that material that's coursing through the tree um, really isn't active on other taxa. So you're not going to be poisoning the insect and then poisoning the woodpecker. You know, really the biggest impact is I killed the host. Um, so now it's not food for things anymore. Yeah, I, I think, Ron, I, I other thing that would probably come into play there is the half-life of the active ingredient. These products that we're talking about using, particularly like that tree, it might be a hack and squirt treatment, for example, to create a wildlife snag tree. 
the half-life of that active ingredient is so short, it's not going to be around very long. By the time that tree starts to decompose and, and attract insect and insect larva that would be feeding woodpeckers, that herbicide's likely completely decompose and not there anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just stress that, you know, particularly when you show us showing pictures when we're getting all excited about all this death and destruction of plants, um, that death and destruction is exceedingly selective in the sense of it's happening to plants. I mean, I'm trying to think if there's an exception, but you know, for the herbicides are effective at killing plants because they affect very specific biochemical sites that almost always are unique to plants anyway. So as potent and lethal as they seem, they're potent and lethal just to plants. It really doesn't cross into other taxa. I guess what I would point out, if it did, you know, they're not going to get out of the registration process. If you have the best herbicide in the world, but it's also great at killing everything out there, that's just not going to work. And, and really, that's folks, that's because of the biochemical pathways that these active ingredients work on. Those pathways are only found in plants and they're not in animal systems, which does bring us to the next question. I think, Andrew, you just, it's coming up here right now, negatively affect uh, animals, insects. And one of the things that I'll mention that I learned about uh, relatively recently is the new EPA B advisory box. And uh, this is an advisory now that's on pesticide labels to say whether it does uh, or potentially does impact pollinators. And the herbicides that we're talking about this evening do not contain that B advisory box on them. Are you aware of any? I've never seen that in any of our products that we're using for forestry applications, Art. No, because um, because they'll they'll generate these LD50 values. So these are laboratory values based on. I mean, you know, you know. Sorry, they're literally dosing bees and figuring out at, at what concentration they're affected. And for all these herbicides, they fall into that category of practically non-toxic. So using bees as your indicator, um, they're, they're not going to impact arthropods. Well, it shouldn't, shouldn't impact arthropods. I mean, what I tell people is probably the worst thing is just if you spray them directly, we almost always have surfactants in there and insects are breathing through holes in their body called spiracles. So, you know, worst case, if you're spraying them, you're probably drowning them, but you're not poisoning them. And, and I've worked with a lot of wildlife biologists, particularly around the invasive plant spectrum there. And, uh, you know, they recommend, you know, these plants are doing more harm to some of these uh, insect and wildlife populations than the herbicide treatments. And again, you know, we're talking about, you know, very targeted, you know, minimal uses here. I think I calculated one time that the amount that we're using herbicides to treat forest land in Pennsylvania would take us over 800 years to treat the entire state just one time. And so we're using very, very small amounts here. And just to pile on that, because, you know, I, I think that, that that seems to be a subtext in, in a number of the questions is when you step back and, and look at this system, I like how Randy Westbrooks, who I think now is with USGS, are probably retired, but, you know, phrased it as, you know, let, let's compare herbicides as chemical pollution and invasive species as biological pollution. So you introduce an herbicide into a system. It's a synthetic molecule, um, but it does have breakdown pathways. Um, you know, the, they, they do break down. They are food for microorganisms in the system. And sure, yes, they are definitely having some sort of impact. I mean, you, you kill layers, trophic layers in the system, there is an impact. But removing those plants with that very short-term introduction of a chemical into the system has, is much less of an impact than that biological entity being there and actually increasing and increasing its impact over time. And, and increasing at an exponential rate at some point in the growth curve as well. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Brandon wants to know what backpack attachment would you suggest for spot spraying along a, 
along a large stream restoration area with little access. I think that's called a boat. Um, <laughs> there, there's two ways to address that. Um, like that last slide I showed, um, just for an example, um, I mean, I do a fair amount of work at Ohio Pile State Park in Pennsylvania along the Yakagani River Gorge, um, where we're treating Japanese knotweed and our best access is by boat. But let's just say limited access points you want to be able to spray at as low a volume as possible. Um, so for instance, you know, that's where that thin vert system that I described comes into play. So I can fill my two, well, let me think about that. It's a four gallon backpack, a 20 liter backpack. Is that right? Sorry, 15 liter backpack. With that single backpack using thin vert, I can treat three quarters of an acre and if you're and think, you know, at first glance, that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're spot treating um, that three quarters of an acre of treated area within your operational footprint might actually be a significant portion of it. So if you're doing enough of that work, that investment in something like Thinvert is going to pay off. If not, then you really just, okay, you just you calibrate and you train yourself so that based on the target, uh, like if I'm treating woody plants, I figure I can get down to about 15 gallons per acre. If I'm treating herbaceous ground layer stuff, fern, um, Japanese stilt grass, I can get down to 10 gallons per acre. So at least now my four gallon backpack, wait, let me do the math. Okay, four tenths of an acre. So for not a whole lot of weight on your back and investment in material, you know, th that would be, you know, based on the criteria we're presented, that would be plan A. So going to the Thinvert application method art. Okay, um, so like I mentioned, it is, I'll use the term proprietary because you end up having to buy both the carrier because um, that's what, you're mixing that one part, this thin vert carrier, two parts water to make this, think of it as like thin mayonnaise. Um, and then you do need the specialized nozzle because what, I mean, it's the two go together. You can't just use a conventional nozzle and get the effect that you want. This $120 nozzle, what it's doing, they're coming out of these individual streams and breaking into these very uniform droplets. So where they land is, is very predictable. So it's a really nice system in terms of consistency of deposition of material. Um, what you're just looking at though is the concentrate costs about $22 a gallon. So at five gallons and well, so that's, I can do the math here, you know, and a third of your mix is going to be the concentrate. Um, you know, so if your two and a half gallon jug of material, if you mixed it up with five gallons of water, that's going to cover an, um, yeah, an acre and a half. Um, plus you've got that equipment, but, you know, let's face it. I mean, if you're working for somebody else, the cost here is your labor. Um, so you're definitely devoting a lot more of your labor to spraying. So, you know, for the, it's better for you and for the customer, because you can come in at a lower price because you're just coming in and out of the site so much less frequently because you're mixing so much less. Okay, great. I have 824 and we still have a number of questions. So let's, uh, let's keep moving. Kevin asks, you give an example of removing small striped maple and black birch from the understory. If not careful, invasives will take over quickly. What would be the best things to grow in this understory, especially something that would produce shade that would stop further invasives from growing? Well, my first thought is certainly, you know, we're trying to remove that shade, that low shade in particular, so that we can bring light to the forest floor. And yes, absolutely, it may encourage the growth of invasive plants there when you do that. So you do have to be cognizant of that. And that means, you know, you move into that maintenance mode, as Art mentioned. I would say, let's wait and see what will grow there naturally first. Uh, before I even consider planting anything, because that's really what we want to do is let Mother Nature put there what should be growing there by giving it that sunlight. So I wouldn't recommend planting anything at this stage. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Wick. Do you have any recommendations for 
winter creeper. I assume he means treating winter creeper. I haven't worked with it firsthand. I'm going to equate it to behaving similar to Japanese honeysuckle. I'm assuming where he is, it's staying green all winter. Well, so that, that leaves two things. One, you know, once you get into the summer season, it's just like everything else with leaves. But if it is, if it is retaining its foliage in the winter months, um, that does give you the opportunity to, to work against it quite selectively because nothing else has foliage out at that time. Now, the exact prescription, I don't know. Um, that's where, you know, that's where I say, hey, Google, um, or duck, duck, go. Um, I, I think it's pretty likely that folks that have already, I mean, if I was going to guess, I'd be starting with glyphosate and what else am I going to add? And actually, I would still tend to go with my plan A as glyphosate and triclopyr. Um, but, you know, that's one where I would definitely see what experience has been documented. But, you know, there are definitely broadly species that keep their foliage in the winter. It's been documented that they do respond to herbicides. You know, Japanese honeysuckle is a good example. Yeah, he added a comment saying it's extremely waxy and evergreen. So I would assume you'd have to have some sort of surfactant added to whatever treatment you use. Right. For foliar treatments, we're always doing that. And um, I would really... I, I, I ditched a slide early, you know, before we started just to save time. But one of the things I would stress too, particularly if you're working on your own property, you know, this is an ongoing incremental process. And just come to realize there's going to be certain species that just don't go away the first time. And they're going to take multiple episodes of encouragement from you for that to happen. And it could very well be that uh, like English ivy is, is one that's described the same way as it's just it just takes multiple operations and that's just how it is. It's not a question of, no, really, there's a silver bullet. It's like, no, the silver bullet is you going back and doing it again. Okay, Scott wants to know, in what category would you place running bamboo? Um, actually, from those growth forms, let me think about that. It's, it's a woody, well, it's, I'm going to say, well, it is a, well, some would argue grasses aren't technically woody, but let's, let's not even go down that rabbit hole. Um, so yeah, Adam, Adam says for him, it's a grass. Well, it is a grass. It's definitely a grass. It just happens to be one with perennial stems that live four or five years. So in our scenario, we would describe that as a suckering woody plant. Um, the approach, it kind of has a prescription all of its own. Like if, you know, if I'm going to go after bamboo, what I'm going to do is, you know, it fires up new growth. I mean, where, where we are in May, but whenever it fires up that new growth and as it's just beginning to reach terminal height before it leafs out, I would cut the entire stand to the ground, wait for it to regrow and then foliar treat it probably in September and then wait to see next spring how alive it is. Because it's, if it's alive, it's going to fire more shoots, mow them off again, and kind of repeat the process. But um, So it's just a, a variation on a suckering woody species. Yeah, we, we often think of it as very similar to the Japanese knotweed treatment that we have outlined in our fact sheet. Okay, I have, eight, I have 829, so we have a couple more. Uh, but I uh, just want to let people know that uh, we'll be back again Thursday night if you need to jump off here at 8.30. Uh, we'll be back at the same place at 7 p.m. to talk about non-herbicide and non-chemical treatments, and that'll wrap up the series. So uh, get back into the questions. Allison asks, once a large area of stiltgrass is treated, is it realistic that native slash desirable plants such as wild blueberry, for example, and wooded areas will come back on their own, or would it need to be a system of plantings to reestablish understory habitat? So I would say that all of these kinds of situations, whether to plant or not, really depend on what the deer impact is going to be. So yes, I've seen areas that were treated that were nothing but stilt grass that grew tremendous 
you know, beautiful native stuff, but most of those situations were inside of a deer exclosure. So if your deer impact is not bad, absolutely, you'll see that stuff come back. It may not be the exact species you were looking for, so it may still warrant some enrichment planting of something that you did want to grow there. But, uh, you know, in the absence of high deer impact, yeah, native plants will reestablish. I would just stress controlling stilt grass in a given year means you've controlled it that year. It's coming back next year. Now, if you have facilitated the release of other things, now you're going to have this mix. And you do have ways to selectively remove the stilt grass, but it's almost certain that it's coming from an established seed bank. So it's going to be persistent in its appearance. Okay. Yeah, this yeah, we don't have a magic bullet for stilt grass. <laughs> we can only keep it away for so long, but yeah, it will come back eventually, at least in some to some extent for sure. Okay, this one has a number of ideas, so it may take a little bit to, to work on. They're looking for a recommendation for wisteria control of vines that are four feet or shorter for a person who cannot be in wild areas due to anaphylaxis. Uh, the idea is to uh, use Garlon 4A. Is treating the stems from November to March effective enough, or should the roots be exposed and treated as well? The wisteria originates outside a fence line where it has climbed up trees and taken over. I'm trying to keep it from taking over the space inside of the fence as well. So we're asking about the effectiveness of, of Garlon on wisteria as well as uh, at a time when, when bees are, are active? Well, here, here are your constraints. Wisteria is, is it's a suckering woody species as well as a rampant vine. So to get the control you want, you, you need to kill the root system. And the way you're going to kill the root system is by you know, working in that summer window. Um, and you can treat, I mean, if, you know, I realize sometimes the, the wisteria stems are like trees themselves. Um, so, so you're kind of looking at scale and operations, but to get that root system, you need to treat it in those summer months. Um, and it sounds like it's coming, it's sharing properties too. So I almost have a feeling that based on the constraints that, as I understand them, I think I would just vigorously cut it. Okay, we had two left over in the chat. Are there any thought, do you have any thoughts on using diesel fuel for the basal oil, basal oil carrier? <clears throat> I think I would discourage people from doing it, even though it's on the label. Um, I mean, it's just vile. Um, I think it increases the hazard to the user. It just stinks. Um, and I think, I haven't seen data, but there's some speculation that in some instances it might be inhibitory because I don't, I don't know if diesel is actually phytobland. You know, if you're working on a non-suckering species and you get enough triclopyr in that zone that you treated and it kills the cambium, tree's dead. It doesn't matter if you have translocation. But if you're relying on translocation and it turns out that the diesel oil is damaging the tissue and preventing the translocation of the triclopyr, you know, then it's working against you. So I think you just have the, um, the use factors as well as the potential that it might be slightly inhibitory to discourage it, you know, even though it's like a third of the cost of, of buying a basil oil. Okay, and finally, he said, I heard recently someone say that one should only remove one third of the invasives in a stand at a time. I presume this is to sort of gentle into a better ecological balance. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's the first time I've heard that. Um, yeah, I haven't heard that rule of thumb either. Um, 
that's only as much as my back can operate on. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I, I'm fortunate. I think it's sort of like the question is A, and I'm going to say B. I, I think it kind of one of the things that gets back to is if you're prioritizing your efforts from less impacted towards more, um, in that context, I say you just go until you run out of season or you run out of targets. Um, and I'm trying to think what the rationale in a highly infested spot would be to do that other than just sheer boredom. Um, it, it, it's, it, it, let's just say if it's a good idea, the nuance of it is, is beyond my capabilities to determine. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Let's put it this way. On my property, they were all gone. It, it didn't take me years. <laughs> Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Some excellent information, and we are a little past 8.30, so I think I will go ahead and remind you that the webinar series finishes up on Thursday night, where we're going to talk about non-herbicide control and e efficacy on competing vegetation. That'll be right back here at 7 o'clock, and we'll wrap up the webinar at that point. And before we go, I do want to remind you there'll be a very quick survey, a couple of questions. Once you close out the webinar, please give us some feedback there. So on behalf of Dave and Art and all of the folks from the Woods in Your Backyard Partnership who were answering questions willy-nilly to help us move things along, thank you very much and thank all of you for joining us. We will see you back here Thursday night to wrap up the series. So have a good evening and enjoy the rest of your week. Good night. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, everyone. Good night, everyone.